channel with the tongue twister title, Marshall Mathers Legal Matters. Is it a download, is, is a, download a sale, or a license? Um, and now in case any of you guys don't know, Marshall Mathers is Eminem. Now, unfortunately, uh, Ken Hertz, who's in your um, program, uh, had an emergency and is not able to make it today. But very fortunately for us, Peter Strand has agreed to step in, and he just taught this case to his law school class. So we're lucky. And I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves briefly. Okay. Um, my name is Perry Resnick. I'm a business manager with RZO. And, um, I do audits of record companies and music publishers, so I'm very um, aware of how they pay the artists. That's why I'm on this panel. <laughs> or not. My name's, or not. Or my name's not. Dave Fry, and I'm a manager. And uh, I've been uh, in the business since 1979, but I've been a manager since 1991. My name is Peter Strand. I'm a partner in the boutique feedback law firm of uh, Lemon Strand and Glover, uh, former musician, and I also am an adjunct professor uh, of music and entertainment law at Chicago Kent College of Law. Okay, so we're going to be discussing three cases today. Uh, the first is the Eminem case, and this was an appellate court decision um, in the Ninth Circuit, which is the West Coast. And Eminem had lost. I still think this is so loud. Em without? Pardon? I'll leave it on because they need it, I think. So Eminem had lost on summary judgment below, and he'd also lost the jury trial. Uh, next slide. Okay, so Eminem's contract had a provision that governed his payments on records sold. And that provision's up here on the left, and it says he got 12 to 20% of adjusted retail price of all full, pli full price records sold in the United States through normal retail channels. He also had a provision in his contract that governed masters licensed, and that's the language on the right that says, notwithstanding the foregoing, M&M is to receive 50% of aftermath. Now, aftermath is universal. It just got sold a lot. Um, aftermath net receipts on the masters licensed by aftermath to others for their manufacture and sale of records or for any other issues. Now, Eminem had also uh, renegotiated, and he had two contract addenda. He had a 2003 addenda that increased his royalty rates, um, but notably he had the exact same wording in the record sold and master's license provision. And then he had a 2004 addenda that said, Sales of albums by way of permanent downloads shall be treated as normal retail channels net sales for the purposes of escalation. Next slide. Okay, there you go. So the court framed the issue as whether the contract's record sold provision or master's license provision sets the royalty rate for sales of M&M's records in the form of permanent downloads and master tones. Next slide. Now, so lawyers, we care about arcane things like contract language and interpretation. But why is this issue important? So I'm going to turn to the panelists now to ask them why labels or artists care about this issue and what does it mean in dollars and cents? Well, in terms of dollars and cents, for a record sold on a, like a CD, you get a royalty based on the price, and it's usually in the 15% range or so based on the, on the price. Whereas when you master, license a master, you generally get 50% of the receipts of the record company. So the difference is about three times, it's about one third of, of uh, a royalty is about one third of what it would be if it was 50%. Um, if you do a uh, download of 70 cents, is what the record company gets. So 50% of that would be 35 cents that the artist would get as a sale, I'm sorry, as a license. As a sale, they would get more like, um, as a sale they get more like um, t 10 cents or so. It's more like you get about 10 cents for a sale. And, so we're and, talking and you're getting about, per and song. You get, and you, per song, and you get right. about 35 cents per, per uh, license. So it's a, about a three, three to one difference. 
Okay. Okay. So, that so that's, why, uh, that's why artists care about it. That's why it's so important. <laughs> and that's why labels care about it. That's why labels care about it's, it. It's, it's very important. You know, we're talking about three times the amount of payout. Yes. What, what I had found is that I was looking at statements, and the statements were getting fatter because there were all these so, so. digital sales, even though the digital sales were a small fraction of the total. And what I noticed one day was that I'm looking at this one song, and I noticed that on the CD, it makes about 10 cents a unit. And this is, a, this is an older contract from 1976. It's not very favorable in the artist's favor. And then I noticed that that same song through iTunes was paying four cents. How can the physical CD pay a percentage more, at least, 50, at least yeah. twice what the download pays, right? So I go to our accounting person and say, what's a 573.86 deduction? And they go, oh, that's a container charge. So the container charge was 25%. The new media deduction was 25%. Mm -hmm. Breakage and returns were 15%, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All these things that would apply to, I mean, how does that ever apply to a download, right? So I called the label and I said, can anyone talk to me about this? And they were like, no, no, go away, you know. So I kept doing that, and they said they, they wouldn't, they just were being dicks. So I, the only thing we figured we could do was to make an issue of it, because another part of that 1976 agreement dealt with making phonograph records that are pressed at a pressing plant and then sold to a third party, which is a store. And then when you look at the Apple, license, the Apple agreement, at the top, it says license. So, and, and in the agreement, it said a license, everything on a license, which is to a third party, a film, a commercial, whatever, is half, 50%. So, so you have like, the same issue like as M&M. Yeah, this is a bunch of crap, you know? So we got involved with this class action lawsuit. And, and the, different, the different majors handle it differently. And right, that, yeah, I mean, like, you see for example, for example, For example, Universal is the biggest record company in the world, and they would, not charge downloads on digital because they would want to pay you a royalty rate instead of 50%. So they said, okay, we'll give, you, we'll give up the packaging deduction. There's no package, that's fair. The record company you were dealing with, which is a different major, was, yeah. the, was the worst. But even, the, but even the difference between giving up the packaging and charging as a license or sale, right. like as he said, mm -hmm. if they charged as a sale, it would be 10%. If they charged as a sale with all the deductions, it's 4.5%. Right. I mean, four and a half cents. Sense, right. But yeah, if yeah. they actually paid it as a license, it would have been 35, 35 cents. cents yes. So now can we get... Now multiply that by 10,000 or 50,000 or 100,000. A million, thousand, if right. maybe you have... <laughs> Depending on the downloads, right? Yeah. Certainly it's serious money. Right. Yeah. Uh, can we get the next slide? And um, sorry, this is like really paradise for all the lawyer geeks in the room, but probably really tedious for everybody else. But we have to focus on the language in the contract because that's what the decision turned on. So first I want to ask the panel, is this kind of language where you have one price for a record sold that is, you know, well, 12 to 20 percent is probably pretty high because he was M&M, &M, and then 50 percent for licensed. But is this language fairly typical? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And. Um, Eminem, when we talked about, he'd renegotiated uh, the addenda, and he had those two addenda. And obviously, I think a lot of people, if they're successful, renegotiate mm -hmm. their rates. Sure. Um, but then he had that other addenda that provided that, um, that the digital downloads will count as sales through normal retail channels for the purposes of escalations. Is that a fairly common clause, or is that fairly unique? It's more for higher, higher artists, higher level artists. You know, okay. we might give a little historical perspective why these are, 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 are calculated so differently and why there's such a huge difference between what the artist would receive. On the sale over here, that's the record company basically bears all the costs of, of production, recording, manufacture, creating the artwork, uh, distribution, and, and bears the risk when it goes out to retail. And that's why traditionally the artist has you know, gotten a small percentage of a defined 
a royalty base and you have to read through all clauses of the, of the contract to figure out exactly what 10% means. And this is, is generally a situation where the, the record company has almost no costs, has no responsibility other than, you know, in, in the old, this is, this is a great example of the collision between the old world and the digital world because in the old days the record company would simply turn over the master to, to a third party for a license fee and the third party would then absorb all the costs of whatever the enterprise was going to be. Uh, using it as a soundtrack in a film or a television show or selling it at KTEL Records on television or anything like that. Yeah, the record clubs did that as the record, well. Yeah, and, and that's why, uh, the, you know, record companies don't generally care to give up big percentages of money they're receiving, but it became harder for them to justify a, a much smaller percentage when they had no cost to offset. And so that's why, and, and you know, the, the uses weren't as prominent they certainly were in the business of selling records, not licensing masters quite as, uh, you know, prevalently. So they are more willing to give up a, a piece. And it, and it looks great to an artist when you say, yeah, you know, whatever we get, you'll get half. That's, it, it's sort of comfort food in the record contract. Now, do contracts for art, that artists are signing today uh, still have these provisions um, without specifying about digital downloads, or are digital downloads in today's contracts dealt with explicitly? Generally, there's a there's a, a explicit express provision, but you know, with Dave's artists talking about contracts that were 30 plus years old, right. and uh, the courts, and, well, the parties were struggling with what what does this new technology mean? So and one of the interesting things, though, is, is the record contracts generally provide for new technology. CDs are often still considered, new you know, 30 years after the fact, new technology or new media, and, and therefore bear a reduced royalty rate. 25 percent. Yeah. Now, when did, when did the contract language change so that they started dealing with digital downloads? Right after this decision in M&M, for one. Well, uh, in the, in the, the mid-90s, they started knowing about this upcoming digital, right. digital environment. So around the mid-90s, they started putting all these clauses into the contracts about digital and digital and, and, all and future electronic, technologies. electronic uh, transmissions. And right, okay. Like However, there are today still artists that are Plenty. producing under old contracts, oh, sure. even producing new works because of the mm -hmm. length of mm -hmm. the contracts. Yes. The, okay. older, the older the contract is, the better chance you have of not having digital language in it. Okay. Can I get the next slide, please? So according to the Ninth Circuit, the issue turns on whether UMG licensed the m and masters to third parties. So... Um, well, you already actually told us the types of uses that are generally, historically, have been licensed uses. Uh, synchronization as well. Soundtrack, synchronization, compilation, KTEL. Um, okay. Rec record clubs. Record kind of clubs. Can we get the next slide? Okay, so uh, the court looked at the dictionary definition of license. They said permission to act. They didn't want anything to do with what lawyers thought license meant. And they found that Aftermath licensed iTunes and cellular carriers to use its recordings to produce and sell downloads and master tones. So the court found that the contract language was unambiguous and that Eminem should have been granted summary judgment below. And the court also found, not only based on the dictionary definition, but uh, based on copyright law. They found the copyright law supported their decision because Aftermath didn't sell any copyrights or transfer any copyrights. All the ownership and the rights remained with Aftermath. So I want to ask the panelists if they think the court got it right. right well, that's something I didn't see in, in, in this particular decision, but maybe applicable to other questions of this, whether it's a sale or a license, is that mm -hmm. the, the the title transfers. When, they, when the record company sold a CD to a, they would sell it to a distribu the distribution company would sell it to a wholesaler who would sell it to retail stores and they, they would sell it to the wholesaler and the wholesaler would buy it and sell it, resell it to the retail stores and they, the title transferred. Title for the physical goods. Right, for the physical yeah. goods. The third party. Right. When, when the record companies 
selling it to Apple. Apple's not taking title, right? Is that correct? Right. Well, I, I, I think... I'm not, I mean, I'm not an attorney, but I right, think well, that's but the case. The, the difference is because even before they were just selling the physical product, mm. never the copyright, but it was mm. the product actually that was being sold. And I believe, because you now actually contract directly with iTunes, that the labels yep. relationship with iTunes is called a license. Correct, yeah. It says license at the top. I think that's a license. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know. Maybe the attorney could explain it otherwise. Well, you know, it, it's interesting that, as Ann said, the, the court simply looked up the word license in the dictionary, and that's because there was not a definition of the term license in the contract. And, and it looked like there's some evidence introduced as to what license might mean in context. But the court said, we don't have to bother with all of that. We give the words their ordinary sense and meaning, and we looked it up, and as Ann said, it said permission to act. Uh, and, and as Perry was just saying, you know, there, there was title passed because there was an element or, or, or a, a passing of the risk of loss from the record company to the wholesaler to the, to the retailer. So that, you know, if the wholesaler's warehouse burned down, the record company had sold those records. The, that was the loss of the warehouse. So, you know, each of those transactions was like building a liability protection for the record company, which obviously they don't have when they're, when they're simply delivering a digital file to an e-tailer like iTunes. So now can we get the next slide? And uh, we're going to take you across the country. Uh, the Ninth Circuit is basically most of the West Coast. Um, so now we're going to go to a lower court decision uh, in New York that dealt with similar issues in, uh, with Bob Marley's contracts. Now, you non-lawyers in the crowd um, are going to be a little annoyed because all these decisions turn on the specific language contained in each contract. So we now have to look at contract language again and look at the actual language in the Bob Marley contract. So can we get the next slide? Okay, so again here, we had the label arguing that digital sales and master tones are governed by the provision on the left um, that says royalty rates and methods of royalty calculations for records released in formats newly developed, newly developed as a result of advanced technology shall be paid at the royalty rate of the then top popular recording artists. And then you had the Bob Marley estate arguing that the provision on the right applied that said when Island sells or licenses third parties to exploit the masters via telephone, satellite, cable, or other direct transmission to the consumer over wire or over the air, he would get 60% of the receipts attributable therefrom. So uh, now again, I'm going to ask our panelists, because uh, this language is different from the language that we just saw for M&M's contract. Um, which language do you think is more typical? Because in every case, it's going to look at the language. So I think I'm right. just wondering which. I don't think either are typical. I mean, they, they don't often offer you the to match the top, top 10, 10 right. the one, and the other is 60%, uh, that's, that's pretty good. Right, no, I, I mean, they're both, yeah. they're both like. The language is good, but the rate's a bit higher. Right, right. no, the, yeah, I, yeah. Right, no, I, I meant, because um, I know both of these are very, I think both of these are very unusual. I was wondering which is more typical, the Bob Marley language or the M&M language? I see, the M&M language. Because the decision in Bob to Marley, me, that, the decision that this language is going to yield will be okay. different from right. the... Right. I, I think the M&M language is more typical. I think this one, you know, the punctuation is, is really confusing because apparently... They were in Jamaica and, in the early 70s. Right. Okay. There's something that, that... This is if a specific... Is if it's transferred over telephone satellite cable. I know, and it doesn't even, and I did think, oh, but there must be commas, but there are. Right, right. <laughs> well, we have a lot of, we have a bunch of British acts that we work with, and most of the British contracts have no punctuation. I, I think that may be it, because I was looking at other places. Yeah. It's from an island records contract, so that would make some sense, yeah. Right. So, um, well, Perry, with Bob Marley, 
Like, how much money would we be talking about? Well, he, he sells millions. I, I haven't multiplied it out, but right. like I said, it's about, it's about three to one in terms of what he would get under a sale or under a license. So it, it's, it, they're paying him about a third. Island's paying him about a third of what they would be paying him otherwise. Okay. And now, for the decision here, the court found that this language was ambiguous, and they denied the Marley, um, the Marley estate's request for summary judgment and it is going to go to trial. So, if you represented Bob Marley, and you know you have the Eminem case out there, what would your argument be at trial? What would you argue? Well, you'd certainly argue that there's an appellate court with a very well-reasoned and thoughtful and, and very plain English language decision that sorted out the issue. Now, given it was, it was based on, on different language, but the concepts were the same. Are we talking about the sale of a record in whatever format, or are we talking about a license of a master? And, and the same sort of notion applies to sorting that out. What's the investment in each of the products, and, and why is it set up so that one, one generates more income for the label and, and the other doesn't? So now I'll ask you, again, you still have the M&M case out there, if you were Universal's lawyer, what would you argue at trial? I would argue that's the crazy Ninth Circuit. They're a bunch of <laughs> Californians, you know. Um. Right, we, don't have a, we don't have a record company person All on right. the panel, which would have been nice, but, but they say it's replacement, that it's the next, it's a sale because it's replacing CDs, and that's why they think it's a sale. Yeah. And I did see down below, um, in the district court, Universal had argued that the master's license paragraph only applies to broadcasts of masters via cable, satellite, or similar, not to digital sales. Um, although, in, in this, so are they in saying this, it applies to streaming? Then they said, I think so. It's, yeah, just to broadcast. But in, in in the copyright telecommunications area, broadcast is often a term of art that means wireless. So it's kind of contradictory to say via cable, because via cable often by definition means not broadcast. Right, okay. So, but that was their argument um, below. Now I'd, I'd like well, to- It's also contradictory in terms of streaming because st a lot of people think streaming is where everything's heading. And what they're doing, what, the, uh, what Universal and a lot of the majors are doing on streaming is that they, they're getting receipts from the streaming company and then they're paying you your royalty rate on their receipts. So it's a hybrid of receipts and rate. And they're not, they're not paying you a 50% of receipts, they're paying you your royalty rate of 15% or so on the receipts. Oh, and that's, that, that's going to be the next case, you that's guys. That's pretty common practice right now. Really? Yes, and it is. Do you know if anybody's challenged that one? Uh, not that I know of, but it's going to come up, I'm sure. Because I, I know that those agreements also right. say license. The more things, the more <laughs> things turn to streaming as opposed to downloading, which is where it looks like it's heading, the, right. more, the more that's going to come up. I think okay. the, the record company would argue that the ultimate transaction here is one that puts the, the music you know, in control of the consumer and therefore it's more like uh, a, a sale of, of physical media than a master license. Um, and iTunes or, or you know, Amazon or any of the other e-tailers simply fulfill the function of wholesaler slash retailer. And, and they just facilitate a transaction that's really between the record company and the consumer ultimately. But now did they, I mean, previously you gave some examples, a KTEL record or a soundtrack. And that was also a, a distribution between a retailer and a consumer as well. And, and a lot of times that was actually physical product changing hands. Well, for the soundtrack, I meant incorporating into the, soundtra the sound of a film, <laughs> right. not the soundtrack album necessarily. How would they have been paid on a soundtrack, a soundtrack album? A soundtrack album is a license also. It's a third party license right. usually. Um, I was just curious, how, does, how do other entertainment areas deal with this? How does Netflix work? Or how, do, how come movies aren't having this problem? Because they don't pay anybody. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> or, or because they... No royalties? Do you ever see a... I've done a few film audits. They don't pay the participants. Oh. No, they, well, one well, thing films do is, is home media is generally excluded as 
part of the gross income or net income bucket. So, you know, if, if, if you're a film actor, or director, and you're a gross participant, um, that percentage of, which can be huge, 40, 50, 60 percent of the income generated by a film, since theatrical is so low now, doesn't even get counted in the gross participants' income bucket. So, they, as Perry said, they're not paying anybody. They, right. paid, they paid the actors. They do have a strong union with it, that. Except Some, also, that's what I was going to say. Which, which very, musicians don't have. That, well, I was, no. well, I used to work for AFTRA, so <laughs> I'll take, take issue with that. But okay. um, I, I think part of it is that for the, the vast majority of film actors, not all, um, but the vast majority aren't royalty participants. Right. They get a salary, so it's right. not, they, this issue right. never comes up. And then they do have the SAG contract, so that covers the residual use payments. So they, and they never have a royalty issue. Right. Now there are some right. that do, right. but those are the Tom Cruises. Right. right, the Spielbergs. Yeah. The gross, I do find that the gross participants in film do get money, and the net participants never get money, ever. There ain't no net. <laughs> right, there ain't no net. So I want to ask you, Dave, about the Cheap Trick. Um, is you said that Cheap Trick had uh, filed a, was addressing this issue. I guess you, I think you said they filed a case. Can you tell us a little bit yeah, about that? Uh, Cheap Trick were part of a, a class action lawsuit with the Allen Brothers, and a couple of years back we we were singled out, and we settled. Uh, it was something we were more about. Uh, ourselves and not the business, we have to take care of ourselves first. But it was, uh, you know, it, it, as I said, the example I gave before about 10 cents on the physical record and 4 cents on the digital download was uh, hypothetically cheap trick and that uh, we were able to, you know, they were very, once we filed that, they became very, very anxious to take our calls all of a sudden and try to Try to settle with us and make things okay, and um, that's about what Did I you, can Have say. you followed the suit after you settled it? It yeah, well, they settled out with. with it, the, it, it's settling out with the Allman Brothers yeah. too. Yeah, okay. it's, it's going to go away. So can I get the next slide? So we're now going across the pond to the UK, where Pink Floyd is litigating a related case. Um, now you're going to laugh again because now here. We talked about have an artist put in now specific language about digital downloads and what rate should be used on those. Well, yes, they have. And there's still plenty of controversies. So can I get the next slide? So um, unlike the contracts we just discussed, Pink Floyd had amended their contract in 1999 to explicitly deal with digital downloads. So there's no disagreement about what provision governs digital distributions. The contract provides that digital distribution sales shall be deemed sales of records for all purposes, save that the royalty rate in respect thereof shall be at blank percent, they blanked it out in the decision unlike the US courts, blank percent share of EMI's receipts. EMI's receipts shall be calculated at the so-called source so that they shall incorporate the receipt of EMI's licensees, sub-licensees, affiliates, or any third party obtaining rights in this respect directly or indirectly from EMI. Again, we have an English court without any punctuation. Do you want me to translate that? What that Please. means? Yes. <laughs> Pink Floyd's contract basically said they got paid on a wholesale basis, so EMI was accounting to them on the 70 cents. But the at source part of the language says that it will be the eventual receipts of whoever ends up buying it. So they said, well, we should be getting 99 cents per download, not 70 cents. So that's, that was one of the issues they litigated, and they, and they won. Right. This, was, this was decided a few months back. Right. Um, well, and it wasn't, it really wasn't even the 70 cents, 99 cents, because Pink Floyd has a provision that doesn't allow the, the records to be sold as singles. Well, that was a second issue. But that, that was, was a that second was another, that issue. That was a second issue, yeah. yes. Right. Because they did specifically deal with this, and um, in a summary judgment issue, uh, where the court thought that the language was clear, it didn't see how retail sales could be excluded with this language, 
And notes that exclusivity isn't referred to at all, because EMI was arguing that it only refers to exclusive licensees, and the court said it doesn't say that. And um, they also really found that contracts at nine, entered into 1999 when the area was so unknown, EMI tried to say, well, we're going to do an industry standard. And they said, he's not going to apply an industry standard in 1999 because digital downloads were new. There was no industry standard, according to the judge, and he didn't want to make one up. And he also felt that at that time in 1999, since it was so unclear, it's actually very reasonable to interpret at source to encompass as many royalties as possible. It's also interesting that the presentation, the uh, EMI brought in an industry expert who testified over and over again that any experienced music lawyer would interpret any of these provisions in the manner that EMI interpreted. And the Pink Floyd lawyer uh, basically said, it says what it is in the contract. That's all the further we have to go. And the judge uh, kind of spanked the EMI lawyer saying, you know, you can't sustain this argument. You have no place to go with it. I think that we have a Pink Floyd fan at the bench here, so. Yeah, I mean, it was because in the publishing world, uh, at source doesn't include retailers. And that's the argument that EMI was putting forward, saying, well, we have to look at how, what, what this term means in the music industry, what it means in the publishing industry. And the judge says, this isn't the publishing industry. This is 1999. I'm not going to imply any meaning except for the language. And in Pink Floyd's case, obviously, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars. They haven't released any numbers, but you, you know how many records Pink Floyd sells. So, so now this language, is this language at all typical? The one you just read? The, the Pink Floyd language, yeah. yeah. The at source. Yeah. The, that is not typical at all. Okay. I mean, I would love to start getting at source language into record contracts. It's pretty standard in publishing contracts, but you never see at source language in record contracts. It's very, you have to be the top of the top to get, and I would love if any lawyers out there are negotiating contracts try to get at source language in the record side. Because it really is an important thing to, for artists. Do you guys think the court got this right? I'm not going to say they got it wrong. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's British law, too, which is a very, you know, it's a very specific set of circumstances. Right. Do you foresee this issue coming up in the U.S.? Well, probably not if it's very specific language. Well, not, I don't know about in the U.S., but we have a couple of clients who are British as well in my firm, and we've done some audits as well. And not, not the at source one, but what Peter was talking about before, where they had to, they could not release singles. They had to sell it as a whole album, and they had to. They could only release uh, sell on down on iTunes as a as it was delivered to the record company as a full album, which makes perfect sense in Pink Floyd's case because they'll do concept albums, and it's really a whole. It's not meant to be sold track by track. Right. And we have a couple of clients as well where we're doing. We have the same claim in, where we're saying the re the clause says that it has to be released as delivered. So we're, we're going to be using this as a precedent, without a doubt. Well, I think we can move into that issue since we're actually, we've finished our um, accounting if it's a sale or a download. And what you were just talking about is another issue that this, uh, that this case, uh, the Pink Floyd case, held is that um, EMI had no right to release Pink Floyd uh, singles on iTunes. Pink Floyd has in their contract specific you know, coupling clauses and it has to be either released as delivered or they need Pink Floyd's permission. And Pink Floyd won on that issue as well. Do you foresee that issue happening in the U.S.? If it's in the contract, if the contract says it has to be released as delivered, I don't see why not. Do you see, is that typical language in U.S. contracts? No. It would be there would be very few. I mean, Pink Floyd is a unique, unique artist in, in the terms of, of the product it puts out, the albums, the, you know, the, as you said, they're concept records. And uh, there are very few artists that would have this kind of artistic integrity provision in a record contract. Well, I mean, Not one of my clients is... be able to yeah. get it, yeah. I mean, one of my clients is, is one of the biggest 60s acts that, out there, and, and they 
were known for selling, you know, they had all these number one singles in the 60s and 70s, and, but they still have the language that has to be re released as delivered to the record company. So the record company cannot release singles without their permission. The permission. Yeah, even though they were a singles act in the 60s and 70s. Okay. Going and, uh, forward, no one's going to get it, though. Well, okay. Does anyone know if, if like, Jethro Tull, uh, if, if Thick as a Brick is a <laughs> single or an album? Yeah. And do they get paid 99 cents? Like, is Ian Anderson, like, really pissed off? <laughs> yeah. what, what do they got on McConville's? No, but it's just it's, no, one, it's, one, long, it's, a, it's one long. It's a forty-five minute that's what song. I'm saying, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Well, and, me and mechanicals, though, it does yeah, okay. at least under the compulsory for Based each additional time. minute. You yeah, get, okay. yeah. I do. Does anybody here have any questions? They break it up, is what they do. Okay. Yeah, the docs, I'm We've sure got they some mics yeah, here too. They break it up. Yeah, yeah I want to download it just to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Paul Ramp, attorney. Um, there was the addendum in the m and m agreement which said something about downloads would be treated like physical sales for the purposes of escalation it would seem like the ninth circuit decision rendered that language meaningless actually what was really interesting is the ninth circuit found that that language supported their decision because it said for the purposes of escalations. Now, EMI was arguing that, hey, look, we have this addendum. It says they're through the normal retail sales. And the Ninth Circuit says, it said you said they're normal retail sales for the purposes of escalation. And if you meant for other purposes, you would have said it. So actually, that, no, yeah, no that, answer, that language, which I at first found maybe created more ambiguity, yeah the court found created less ambiguity. The case is a cautionary tale for drafting, especially amendments to contracts, and, and be careful using the phrase notwithstanding. <laughs> uh, that came back to, to burn uh, aftermath a little bit. So. Just holler out, Mark. Yeah, I can, yeah. can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah yep. but they're... they're Uh, I'm Mark Traphagen here in Washington. I, I've got a question about, um, for purposes of deciding whether a download is uh, a sale or a license, and that is, what impact does any of the panelists think uh, is presented by the recent Ninth Circuit decision in uh, Werner v. Autodesk, uh, which uh, did a detailed analysis of uh, whether uh, downloaded video games um, were a um, you know, were a license or a sale. Well, I have my opinion, which is that's um, kind of off the cuff, but it's a, I would say it's a different issue because in that case the court was looking at, at the download transmission or the download transfer to the consumer. So it was whether it was a sale or a license to the consumer. And here we're looking at whether it's a sale or a license from the label to the retailer. So was it a sale or a license from UMG to Aftermath? I think everybody agrees that it was a sale from UMG to the consumer, just like if it was a soundtrack in the old days, it may have been a license or, to, or a sale of a KTEL record. It may have been a license from the record label to KTEL or to the sound recording company, but it was, nobody would argue that they didn't then sell a disc to the consumer, because they did. Where it can have implications as possibly for sales tax purposes and things like that, there could be implications for, for the companies or the... Or the uh whether they have to collect sales tax and pay it to the government yeah. or not. I don't know what they... Should I ask you, Tanya, what you think? <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Yeah, the, I think that the M&M &M case, you know, I, I assume that all the contracts have been rewritten since this decision, anything going out. And it kind of creates a class of artists now that are, are sort of 
not in the same category as, as Cheap Trick and Allman Brothers with contracts that predate the digital era, but are pre-M&M decision cases, and uh, Universal is, is, is going to have to recalculate, and it's going to have a huge impact on their bottom line if there are significant sales. Well, um, don't you want, I mean, I, when I was reading this, I wondered about the lawyer who in 2004 negotiated the addendum saying that, you know, with the sales of downloads shall be treated as normal retail channels, net sales, for purposes of escalations. Because in 2004, this was already an issue. I mean, there had already been label le letters sent by artist groups to the record labels about this issue. So I'm wondering why in 2004 they didn't draft it more clearly. Yeah, I, you know, my guess is it was an accommodate, you know, the, the artist lawyer called up and said, you know, we've got all the, you know, we've just looked at the statement, we have physical media sales and we have digital sales, and we're now, we should be into the escalation point and you should be paying a higher royalty. And, you know, the label said, well, no, we're not counting digital downloads as sales. And, and they said, well, you got it from now on. And they, they wrangled over it and they threw that language in just to accommodate the artist because it, it's not that big a cost to the record company because right, we're talking about, you know, have, have we sold, you know, 100,000 units or 105,000 units or 110,000 right. units? It's the difference between 18% and 20%, for right. example, so it's not yeah. huge. And only once you're successful. And initially yeah. it was really all about one song. I mean, at, the, just trending-wise, when people were buying off iTunes or that, at the beginning, they would just buy one song. They weren't, people weren't buying albums on iTunes. They were buying albums still at stores. So it's kind of now evened out a lot more. But initially, it was just singles. So you, they could say, well, just a single song. Anyway, it's 99 cents. It's not a full mm -hmm. record. And well, we've taken the position in, in, in my firm and on, some ish, on some of those that we have track equivalent albums, what we call it, 10, 10 downloads or 12. You could say 12, but we use 10. 10 downloads equals an album. So if there are 10 singles, downloads, we call that one album for purposes of album sales. Well, now this is going to be the... But they don't. This is no, actually going to... Well, we fight about it, and then yeah. some settlement happens. This is actually know? going to be... that. You led into a really interesting question, because recently I heard, and I think it was Universal, it may have been one of the different, different labels, that their biggest revenue stream from iTunes right now is I, I think you can pay three dollars to complete your album mm -hmm. if you've purchased right. two or three singles. Right. Then you pay three dollars and you can get all the rest of the singles. And that that is now where most of their money is coming from. So you're going to have eight, seven or right. eight sales for about three dollars. Okay. And has I haven't seen that particular that issue <laughs> running through, but it's a, it's similar, right? Exactly, and it's all going to come out in the wash. It'll, we'll see how it, where it washes out. Yeah, I think that it is unusual that this case made it all the way through decision in the Ninth Circuit without settling. And um, it wouldn't surprise me if the other majors were calling up Universal and saying, settle this damn thing, we don't want a decision that's adverse, and ad Universal's lawyers were probably saying, we won down you know, in the lower court, don't worry about it. So. I mean, that's why a lot of this stuff doesn't really get settled, is because when, it, when there's an issue that's very contentious, Major labels throw money at it, and it goes away. Any more? Yep. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just curious, like um, elements like the new technology fee, the packaging and breakage, things that to us that are not lawyers just seem absolutely ludicrous, like that CDs are still new technology. Like, what are the legal provisions or protections for artists when a contract is just so, the language doesn't even make sense anymore? To, to say that somebody's going to lose 25% of their royalty. Well, percentage. it's even crazier than that because they, they, they look at it like, and I, I can understand, they, they go, well, one out of 100 artists is going to make it, 99% are going to fail, or whatever the failure rate is. The failure rate is huge. So they've got all these artists that fail, and they've got just a couple that, make all the money to pay for the ones that are failing and that. And you hear all those arguments like that. But it's gone beyond just, okay, we're just going to, if you make it, we're going to keep all the money and you're not going to see any, which is how it's been since the 20s or whatever. But more or less, I mean, it just kind of changes form. But it's the same 
end result, you know, somebody's doing it, somebody's having it done to them. The, the thing that I'm seeing is like with this 360 stuff is going back to the, you know, Jules Stein MCA records type of contracts where if you were like Chuck Berry, you would sign this contract where with MCA where MCA was your booking agent, MCA was your manager, you had MCA management, you had MCA publishing, MCA records, and you would play all MCA venues. Let's say your records a hit, they'd put you on a tour that was a stiff. They, the bucket of money, it all, it all ends up in their bucket, and the only thing you ever see is the advance. So it, it seems kind of weird that all this Kennedy trust busting stuff has gone by the wayside. And this well, is I, the model again I, and after I'm not all this time. So it's, it's not just the horrible record contract right. that you're used to and you try to maneuver and make better initially and then later when you can if you have some success it's it's gone way into the stress for past it. I don't mean to like, just well, pile I, it on more but yeah. you're right. Well I think that there are going to be two interesting 360 deal issues that will that we'll be seeing at some point as soon as somebody signs one and gets successful. It's virtually antitrust um, isn't it? Well I don't even know but it's it, there's a conflict and there's California case law when like yeah. Geffen tried to manage and publish and they said you can't do that because you have a conflict of interest then. Right. So I think that we may see conflict streams. I also think the fiduciary duty issue may be raised because you know record labels are not or, or so so far they've been held not to be fiduciaries of the recording artists, and they don't have a fiduciary obligation to report. But as they become three six, like They're a manager, a manager does have a fiduciary duty. And as they handle more and more of the artist's business whole in 360, then I think they will be more likely to have a fiduciary duty, and that will give different recourse if they fail to comply with contracts. You know, to answer your question uh, more, I think that the best defense you have is, is knowing how the business works. You should be an informed consumer. Um, you know, I work with lots of young artists and, and uh, it's amazing how powerful the allure of a record contract is and how difficult it is to talk an artist, really of any age, out of signing it, even though you show the artist how bad it is, uh, how dis what disadvantage it is to, their, to the progress of their career. And there's a mentality out there that it can be renegotiated if there's success, and, and there is a, you know, there's a track record of that happening. But you know, if you make an informed decision and you, you, know, you know how the business works and where the money goes and, and uh, you know, what you get paid for what transaction, uh, then you can make a decision that you're going to you're going to take the risk and and go forward. But yeah, uh, and, I mean, hopefully with your eyes open. But at the same time, you're an artist usually, and you've spent your formative years in your room doing scales and stuff like that or whatever. But so you're, <coughs> you know, it's and it's a chance or an opportunity, and chances and opportunities are so few and far between that, you know, you know it, and, and then there's timing and luck. You know, you can be the most, the greatest, some of the greatest artists I've ever seen have never been signed and are living under bridges starving to death. You know, Which means when you're negotiating, when you, when you have an interest from somebody who wants to sign you or, or deal, get a representative who right. knows the right. industry. Right, exactly. Yeah, make, sure you have get an, a music make sure you have an attorney who support. knows the industry, not yeah. just a real estate lawyer or somebody, your, your cousin or something. And, and learn the vocabulary so that you can converse with the lawyer to determine whether he or she actually seems to know what they're talking about. And have them break it down into pennies and dollars for you. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you don't want, oh, you'll get 12%. Well, you want to know what that means in pennies. We have, uh, like as a manager, a lot of times I'll have conversations with artists where it's like, all right, we know we're getting screwed, but we'd rather, you know, we're more afraid of being ignored than ripped off. I mean, we get the question all the That's time. That's a reality. Right. We always get the question from our clients when they're renegotiating contracts. What is the penny rate? What are we getting per record? What are we getting per download? The, the penny rate is really what they want to know 
exactly. It's it's really important because After what you right because what you have are you have people saying oh I got twelve percent oh I got fifteen percent but twelve percent of what fifteen percent of what because the twelve percent could be more than fifteen percent so you really that. need to right, find right, out deductions. you you need the penny rates yeah you know, what are the deductions yeah what well, there are rare occasions stuff. where a court will protect. Uh, someone who made a horrible deal, but generally in the U.S., if you're of the age of majority and not somehow legally incapacitated by illness or, or age or something, you're going to be bound to the contract that you sign. Do we have any more questions? Or okay. Well, I guess just a follow-up question. This on. Okay, so. But it seems kind of contradictory to me for major labels that, like take EMI, they lost Radiohead over this very issue. And it seems like Radiohead is one of these rare career artists now that have the potential to keep putting out great records like Dark Side of the Moon that will continue to sell for generations beyond their time. Why wouldn't it be in their interest to have good terms to compensate artists fairly so that they can have long-term revenue streams coming in? Like it doesn't make sense to screw the artist and then lose them right when they're at the point of putting out classic records like that. So. It all comes down to dollars and cents. When the record companies were independent record companies, when they had people like, like uh, David Geffen or, or, or people or Ahmed or, or, uh, yeah. yeah. or when, they were, when, when they were not owned by these mega conglomerates, then it was about artistic integrity, it was about the record, it was about the career. Once these, once these uh, record companies were bought up by the major conglomerates and Warner Music and Seagram's and all these Vivendi and all these giant corporations, it's all about the bottom line. That's really all it is to them. It's funny because... And, and Pink Floyd's with, not putting out new records. With, with EMI, I uh, just made a joke with Perry a little bit. He's like, that's not funny. But the, <laughs> I'm kind of expecting this next statement to come in and say Citibank at the top. Yeah. <laughs> so they probably went and had to meet with somebody at the bank because and, and there, there was nobody left at the record company because they fired them to save money last quarter. I mean, EMI is. I out, don't mean to yeah. sound harsh, but it's kind of that's where it's going. They, EMI has outsourced their royalty operations to India. There you go. <laughs> and uh, you know they will re they renegotiate if there's adequate success. They do want you know the general philosophy is that a happy artist makes a better record, but uh, only if they can afford to continue the relationship will they renegotiate. I thought it was a starving artist makes a better record. <laughs> okay, thank you guys, and thank the wonderful panel we had. <laughs>